For our second annotated reading, we'll be taking a look at a selection from Sigmund Freud's 1930 book, Civilization and Its Discontents. Most of us probably know Freud as the father of psychoanalysis, so you might be surprised to be reading him in a class on dystopias. Freud was a pretty expansive thinker, though, and much of his writing, while still grounded in his central ideas about our early sexual development, bled into many different disciplines. In the hundred years or so since his heyday, much of Freud's thinking, especially that central tenet, have long been discredited. Honestly, if you mention Freud to one of the psych faculty here on campus, they'll likely sneer. Freud's methods, how he studied and wrote about his patients, in particular his female patients, were particularly problematic. Freud was very much an example of what any scientist should avoid, refusing to consider that your hypothesis is incorrect. Despite all that, Freud had some interesting ideas that those of us in disciplines outside of psychology still find intriguing. One reason I like bringing Freud into this discussion is to call attention to the interdisciplinary nature of this class. You all may have noticed that with many of these X-Core 3010 and 3020 classes, they're cross-listed with a discipline-specific class. Some, in fact, are cross-listed with multiple disciplines. There's a class that's the opposite of this one called the Ideal Society that is cross-listed with English, theology, and philosophy. However, this class has no cross-listing. I did that specifically because I wanted to keep the class truly interdisciplinary. Interdisciplinarity means that we use the ideas and methods of more than one discipline while we investigate some problem. Instead of privileging one discipline, say, literature, we pull from different parts of academia to come to a more robust and thorough understanding of the problem. Last week, we learned about the idea of oppression from a political science slant. This week, we're considering the conflict between the individual and society from this strange Freudian perspective. I hope ultimately that you all will help make this class deeply interdisciplinary by bringing your knowledge of your major and minor disciplines. You all are the experts here, looking at dystopia from all these different angles. If we can truly do that, we will in fact move beyond the realm of the interdisciplinary and into the realm of the transdisciplinary, a vantage point from which there are no disciplinary distinctions. All right, that was a bit of a tangent, but it helps, I hope, to think about Freud in those more interdisciplinary terms. Freud's core ideas may be rooted in the silo of psychology, but he liked to wander around and explore other areas of academia. You'll see how he does this at a number of times in this reading. He'll be making a possibly interesting point about the nature of humanity or founding of civilization, and then we'll suddenly start talking about those core ideas of his. So be prepared to work through a few paragraphs about the sexual developments of infants and of our fixations with various body parts and bodily functions. Again, Freud's claim to fame, which he never let go of, was his belief, according to the philosopher A.C. Grayling, quote, that an infant sexually desires its parent of the opposite sex and is therefore hostile towards because jealous of its parent of the same sex, and that because neither the desire nor the hostility is acceptable, these feelings are repressed into the unconscious, as a result of which internal conflicts arise. And that is this. The Oedipus complex is the key to human nature. As I've said, that claim has long been discredited. Despite the rocky foundation, though, Freud offers us in Civilization and its Discontents some interesting and possibly useful ideas for thinking about dystopia. Freud wrote this particular book at an intriguing time. In 1930, the Great Depression, which had started the year before in the United States, was already spreading around the planet. Freud, living in Germany, may not have been particularly impacted by the, that economic collapse as he was writing the book, but he was likely aware of the devastation it was wreaking. Germany, though, was in its own unique position. In the years after the First World War, the country struggled with hyperinflation of its own and political extremism. At Fro as Freud wrote the book, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazis, was forming and growing in popularity. So it's perhaps no surprise that Freud was exploring at this challenging time what makes humanity so troubled. The selection of the book we will read captures the main gist of Freud's thinking. He writes as if his intent is to explain the meaning of happiness, but his focus really seems to be on understanding what causes us to be not happy. Freud has a very circular way of writing. He'll start off with a question, 
seem to wander off in some strange direction and then pull his thinking back to the question at hand. This may be frustrating style for some of you. Give it some time. If you think you're completely lost, you're not. You're just at the apogee, the far point of the orbit of his discourse. He will, in the end, pull it together, and even if you don't agree with what he says, his points may still resonate with you. Remember his goal with this writing, to understand the nature of human happiness by understanding what makes us unhappy. As you read, think about how Freud's ideas fit with the misery being described by Orwell in 1984. There are some timely overlaps if you've been keeping up with the suggested reading schedule. At a few points, Freud launches into some very detailed footnote discussions. For our purposes, feel free to skip these, unless you find yourself really intrigued by his ideas. Ultimately, Freud offers us a unique perspective into the nature of the individual versus the society, suggesting a paradox that we have created civilization in order to protect ourselves, but that civilization ultimately ends up doing us harm. A paradox which, for those of you already familiar with dystopian literature, know is one of the most common themes. Many of you have said that you got started reading dystopian literature after reading Lois Lowry's The Giver, in which Jonas, as the receiver of memory, finds himself separated from his community because of the emotions he feels that they do not. In Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, Guy comes to understand how his society has tried to remove any sense of individuality from its inhabitants by burning all books and forcing everyone to watch an endless display of soap operas on the television. In Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, and the series based on it, we see Offred struggling against the brutal patriarchy of the New Republic of Gilead as she remembers the relative freedom she enjoyed before the revolution. In all these dystopias, it's not just the individual pushing back against an unfair society. It's an individual trying to maintain their individuality while their society attempts to strip them of that individuality. In these and other imaginary dystopias, the goal of the society is often to strip the protagonist and anyone like them of any semblance of individuality, any semblance of difference. And often the plots evolve as the protagonist realizes that the only way to preserve their individuality is to topple the society that wants to take it from them. Think about how this fits in with Jung's Five Faces of Oppression. All right, I think that's enough for this pre-reading talk. As usual, take your time with the reading. Freud was a verbose author, and although the text is less than 100 years old, some of the language can be obtuse. Be ready, too, for Freud's sexism to come through loudly. He uses a great deal of gendered language, which might not be surprising for a text written in 1930, but his attitude towards women in general is problematic, to say the least.